What's up, All Stars? Welcome to the School of Ireland. What you're about to watch is a clip from an interview that I did with my friend Rebecca, who is a registered dietitian at the Eating Recovery Center in Baltimore. This clip goes over the different types of eating disorders that you need to know for the AP Psych test. If you're interested in watching the full interview, which covers a multitude of AP Psych topics, I'll put the link in the description for you below. And most importantly, if you or someone you know is struggling with an eating disorder, you can find ways to get help at the National Eating Disorder org website. So starting off, anorexia is probably the one that everyone thinks of when they think of eating disorder. And that is the eating disorder that's characterized by food restriction. Um, it could be characterized by low body weight, weight loss. Um, often we see a very intense fear of foods or an intense fear of gaining weight. And it's not just like, a, oh, I don't like that food. If you were afraid of heights and you were standing on the edge of a cliff, that's kind of the fear that this person may feel when they're faced with a plate of food. So it's a very intense fear. Oh, and then also like kind of body distortion goes along with this one. Um, so really kind of distorted view of themselves and their shape and their weight in regards to how they view themselves. I like to point out kind of like misconceptions along the way because there's so many misconceptions about eating disorder. And the biggest one for anorexia is right? What do we think of based on media of someone who has anorexia? Oftentimes people think of a white, young, female person who's emaciated or thin. And yes, that can present that way. But actually, we can see anorexia in all body sizes. And I think that's a very dangerous misconception, because then people aren't, aren't getting diagnosed if they're in higher weight bodies or maybe they lost weight, but they're still within a quote unquote average weight. And then that delays treatment. So that's called atypical anorexia. And I think it's extremely dangerous. Personally, I think it's a form of weight stigma that people in higher weight bodies aren't being diagnosed with the anorexia nervosa because it's the same symptoms. And her research really shows that the side effects and the medical complications are just as severe. And it actually can be more dangerous because like I said, they're not getting diagnosed and they're not getting treatment soon enough because it's kind of passed over because they're not in a thin or emaciated body. So I think it's really important for people to know that eating disorders can affect all body sizes. You can't tell if someone has an eating disorder by looking at them. I had no idea. Yeah. What about bulimia? Bulimia. So bulimia nervosa is characterized by reoccurring episodes of binging followed by um, purging or like a compensatory behavior. So that could be vomiting, that could be diuretics, that could be laxatives, or it could be excessive exercise. Can you break down what binging is real quick? Yes. And actually I was going to talk about that when we get to the binging one, but we can okay. discuss it now. Sure. So binging is um, an episode of eating a large quantity of food, more than the average person would eat in a sitting. And it's often followed with kind of a loss of control. So it's not like something you sit down that you're like intentionally going to do. It's like it happens, you feel out of control. And then afterwards, it's often followed by episodes of guilt and shame. So you feel like, oh, why did I do that? Binging to the point of being uncomfortable or physically in pain. So if someone has bulimia, that bothers them. And then they're trying to compensate so that they do not gain weight. Oftentimes, well, with actually with all eating disorders, there's lots of co-occurring physical, like medical and mental health issues that go along with eating disorders. Um, with bulimia, it's, we, we see like it's common to see substance abuse, um, just safety concerns, other things that go along with bulimia as well. Not always, but sometimes. Um, so misconception about bulimia. One thing I always like to point out is that purging via vomiting or diuretics or laxatives aren't actually effective weight loss or weight maintenance tools, right? So once you've eaten food, most of your calories are already absorbed before purging occurs. Huh. And with laxatives, your calories are absorbed in your small intestine and laxatives really affect your large intestine. So really when you're using laxatives, besides creating an uncomfortable situation for yourself, you're really just dehydrating yourself, losing fluid and minerals, which can be dangerous in its own right. Um, so often we see people who have bulimia, not always, but again, often are of average weight 
or in higher weight bodies because over time they do tend to gain weight because it's not effective weight loss tool. And which we, I'm sure we'll talk about later can be extremely dangerous. I didn't know that as well. Yeah. Um, so kind of going along with that binge eating disorder, we talked about kind of what defines um, a binge. So the difference between binge eating disorder and bulimia is that someone with binge eating disorder may not always do that comp- do that behavior to compensate for the binge. Instead, it's a lot of guilt and shame. They may follow up with restriction because they felt guilty for overeating. And I think it's important to know, again, like we said with the anorexia, binge eating disorder can affect people in all body sizes. Um, Often we think of people in higher weight bodies, but that's not always the case. It can be the case, but it's not always the case. And the number, and well, just in my personal experience, because I work with a lot of clients who struggle with binge eating disorder, the number one thing that they all have in common is a history of dieting, dieting and trying to restrict intake. So that's really one of the biggest risk factors in in developing an eating disorder. It doesn't cause eating disorders, but it increases the risk. So what causes these different disorders? Yes, the million dollar question, right? So the consensus is there's not one specific cause, right? You might, it's pretty, a popular saying in the field is genetics slows the gun and environment and experience can pull the trigger. So it's multifaceted. We know biology and genetics can play a role. So if you have a family member or a family history of someone with an eating disorder, you do have a higher risk, um, but also kind of your, your environment and your experiences can impact that too. So for example, like trauma can increase risk, um, say something like out of your control, like a global pandemic, for example, yeah. um, can kind of force you to feel like you need to have some control over something and food can be one aspect of that. It could be environment, right? Like if you're subjected to lots of media messages about like ideal body type or you have body dissatisfaction Um, and then like psychological issues play a role as well, like anxiety, depression, um, those types of things. So it's kind of like a lot of things together and similar to PTSD in that two people can be in the same traumatizing experience doesn't mean they're both going to get PTSD. So really it's different for for every person, but it's kind of a combination of multiple factors. Now, I remember reading in a textbook once that sometimes causes of these eating disorders come from uh, households where parents are really weight conscious. Is that true? So let's break that down for a minute because historically, they used to say parents are at fault for eating disorders. We know that's not true. Parents don't cause eating disorders, but, and parents are actually a great ally in helping people recover from eating disorders. I will say this again, one of the number one risk factors for eating disorders in kids and adults is dieting. And we also know from research that weight talk like at home focus on diets, diet products. If a parent is dieting increases risk, weight bullying, whether from family members being like, oh, you should lose weight or friends. Um, all of those like do like are known to increase risk of eating disorder. So when I'm working with an adolescent, one of the things I always ask are, do you guys eat dinners? Do you guys eat meals together as a family? Because that's the protective factor. And is anyone dieting in the house? Is there diet products in the house? Because that is a risk factor. So partly true, but I want to highlight that parents do not cause eating disorders. What are some common myths and misconceptions that people may have about eating disorders? Yes, there's a lot. I think the biggest one is that you can tell someone has an eating disorder by looking at them, right? I work with plenty of people who look perfectly healthy, but are engaging in extremely dangerous and unhealthy behaviors and are extremely unhealthy. Eating disorders do not discriminate. They do, you can, I see eating, we see eating disorders all ages. Oftentimes people associate it with being like a young person's disease and that's not true, right? If you never got treatment when you're younger, you're gonna still struggle with it when you're older. And it can start at all stages of life. We see it across all genders. Um, I actually think Right now, I did. I think I remember seeing a statistic that anorexia in males may actually be more deadly 
simply because they're not getting diagnosed and they're not getting treatment because people don't think males can have eating disorders, which is 100% false. So we see it across all genders, all education levels, all ethnicities, all cultures, um, all socioeconomic statuses. So they do not discriminate. And it's really important to know that because that, again, a barrier to treatment if people aren't thinking about that or noticing that in all types of people. And I think the biggest one is just weight stigma, right? People feel like, oh, you're in a larger body. You can't have an eating disorder. And that is absolutely false. Do you have any stats in regards to everything we've been talking about so far? And I remember reading that there, it's estimated just based on surveys that right now in, the Uni- in America, probably about, let me make sure I'm getting this right. About 20 million women at some point will have an eating disorder and 10 million men at some point will have an eating disorder. Just in the United and, States. Yes, just in America. So that's pretty staggering number. Um, and I think another statistic is just a pretty well-known one is just that eating disorders are the second deadliest mental illness only behind the opioid addiction epidemic. So we're not talking about something that's just a fad or a phase or something that you grow out grow out of. It's an extremely debilitating and life-threatening disease. Well, thank you so much for taking your time out of your day to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. I like doing this because I think there's a lot of misconceptions and I want people to know a little bit more about eating disorders. Thank you so much. Have a great day. No problem.